Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you are in China, uh, thank you for taking time in the evening. Uh, this is, I'm sure, right around dinner time, right after dinner time. So hopefully you've already eaten. Otherwise, you might get hungry during this talk. Um, good morning to those of you joining us from uh, the US or elsewhere. Uh, my name is Devin Lau. I am the Assistant Director of Yale Center Beijing. Uh, and this is, uh, we're lucky to have my good friend and friend of the center as well, Paul Friedman, uh, speaking with us today. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, for those of you guys that are joining us uh, for the first time, uh, just a quick introduction for um, those that are unfamiliar. Uh, Yale Center Beijing is Yale University's first and only uh, university-wide center uh, where we bring uh, many Yale professors and alumni and um, different uh, leaders from around the world to discuss topics of uh, importance. Uh, so we've had everything from uh, climate change to uh, uh, blockchain to uh, philosophy and art uh, and music. And today we have a topic that we know many people are uh, very interested in and quite familiar with, which is food. Uh, and I'm sure Paul Friedman will talk a little bit about um, the ubiquity of food and how that has played its role in uh, being a topic of interest to some people and not to others. Um, let me introduce Professor Paul Friedman. Uh, for those of you that have joined us before, he's a good friend of the center and so he needs no introduction, but I know we have many first timers as well. Uh, professor Paul Friedman is Professor of History at Yale University. Uh, he began his studies in the area of medieval Europe, uh, especially in uh, the study of the history of Spain and Catalan in particular. His research into Europe led him into an interest in spices and the spice trade, uh, which uh, had him asking questions about why certain spices were so popular to the extent that uh, the popularity drove trade and uh, exploration to the extent that it changed the world. And so quite literally, uh, taste and food changed um, the way that our world was working. And so that interest led him into um, further studies into the history of food and cuisine and tastes. Um, he is the author of many books now on food. Um, uh, his food, uh, he edited a volume on the history of food and taste, as well as uh, authored uh, 10 Restaurants That Changed America, as well as American Cuisine, How It Got This Way. His new newest book, uh, Why Food Matters, it will be his uh, topic of discussion today, uh, recently published by Yale University Press. Uh, and so we're very excited to have him. Uh, and so once again, uh, if you're willing to turn on your cameras, please do so, um, especially after his talk, we'll have uh, time for Q&A. Um, and at that point, it would be especially nice to have your cameras on because I will be able to call on you so that you can interact directly with uh, Professor Paul Friedman. Uh, and so with that, I will turn the time over to uh, Professor Friedman. Thank you very much, Devin, and thank you everyone for uh, coming to this talk. I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity to discuss my book, Why Food Matters. It was a short book written during the COVID isolation, or at least during the first period of it in the spring of 2020. <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to be employed uh, and to have enough space at home for my wife uh, and me to work without interfering with each other. So this book is a result of a request by Yale University Press to put together something on food for a series they have on why various things matter. The official name of the collection is Why X Matters. So why translation matters, why architecture matters. But unlike these topics, of course, uh, food is necessary for life. So I'm aware that you could easily say in answer to the question, why food matters. It matters because without it, we won't survive. But of course, I wanted to go a little bit beyond that in two primary areas. One is that food matters to us personally and in terms of our culture. 
how we define ourselves. That personally is our experiences, nostalgia, what we liked growing up, what we miss when we travel, and uh, culturally, uh, collectively, uh, the nature of the food uh, as a cuisine where we grew up. The other wider implication or context for my work is the challenges facing us with regard to climate, um, the climate crisis and the role that food plays in that. So that um, a huge amount of the world's water goes for agriculture. Uh, a tremendous amount of the uh, damaging gases uh, emitted uh, into the atmosphere comes from livestock, livestock rearing, uh, food processing, um, and also from food transport. Um, in the United States, the average produce item sold in markets, supermarkets, it has traveled 2,000 miles. So that is an index of just how um, bizarre uh, the global food system is and how unsustainable it is. So uh, my interest therefore in this book is broadly speaking culture and sustainability. Uh, the importance of food is also in unexpected and even frivolous areas. Uh, Devin mentioned the book that I wrote in 2008 uh, called Out of the East, Spices and the Medieval Imagination. This was about the demand for spices in the Middle Ages. Why was European cuisine of the elites so heavily spiced, so fragrant with ingredients that came from so far away, from India, from Indonesia, <clears throat> uh, from Sri Lanka, from Vietnam, that um, Europeans didn't even really know where these places were. They had an idea of India uh, as being uh, as far east as you can go uh, on the earth and, and believed that India was just across a straits from the island of paradise described uh, in the book of Genesis. Uh, and that one reason why India produced spices was that spices really came from paradise, the earthly paradise. The um, contribution of Marco Polo and other early European geographers that um, uh, China actually was east of India and north uh, disrupted this geographical worldview. But why were spices so popular in the first place that uh, um, people would pay such fabulous sums for these exotic products? That was what that book was about. But the point for our context is that no one needs spices to survive. They're not a strategic product on the order of grain or um, uh, cooking oil or um, uh, uh, produce or meat. They, uh, many civilizations, Han, China, the Roman Empire did perfectly well without spices or I mean, without, um, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, no, uh, uh, not really, that was uh, for sugar. No, uh, uh, every civilization has spices, but the passion for spices that come from far away was a rather unusual medieval European preoccupation. This lust or desire for spices motivated the voyages of discovery and colonization that uh, Europeans undertook in the uh, 15th and 16th century. In a study of plants and globalization, the historian Henry Hobhouse observed, the starting point for European expansion had nothing to do with the rise of religion or capitalism, but it had a great deal to do with pepper. So the notion that something dispensable like pepper should be a force in changing history. The Portuguese adventurer Vasco da Gama 
arrived in India in 1498. The Genoese explorer in the service of Spain, Christopher Columbus, uh, arrived in what he thought was India in 1492. The history of sugar is another and more sinister example of why frivolous or seemingly frivolous edible products matter in world history. Enthusiasm for sugar grew exponentially in the modern world. Uh, if you look at England, the per capita annual sugar consumption at the beginning of the 18th century was four pounds. By the beginning of the 19th century it had arisen to 18 pounds, uh, 60 pounds at the beginning of the 20th century, and now over 150 pounds. Sugar is no more a biological necessity than spices. And this is what uh, uh, I was confused about before. Han China does not have sugar. Neither does the Roman Empire. They rely on honey primarily uh, as a sweetener. So you can survive without sugar. On the other hand, as those escalating figures for Britain uh, uh, show, uh, once you have cheap sugar, people's consumption uh, will increase almost uncontrollably. The reason that sugar was inexpensive and widely available by 1900 um, was because of slavery. No other edible commodity has as disastrous a global impact as sugar. Slavery was brought to the Caribbean islands and Brazil, that is the importation of African slaves on a massive scale uh, in order to cultivate and process sugar. And people were aware of this at the time. So an English politician named James Fox, who was a vigorous opponent of slavery, wrote in 1791 that every cup of tea or any other beverage sweetened with sugar is, quote, steeped in the blood of our fellow creatures, unquote. European demand created immense profits for sugar cultivation. It's refining, it's shipping and distribution. The demand for sugar first came from new caffeinated beverages that were fashionable, new in the sense that uh, uh, Europeans had never had them before. They were well known in other parts of the world, but only imported into Europe beginning in the 16th century. Tea, coffee, and chocolate. And the point is that um, tea is not necessarily drunk with sugar all around the world. In fact, in China to this day, um, generally speaking, if I'm correct, uh, tea is not thought to be uh, uh, appropriate. The sugar is not appropriate for tea. Um, in uh, the Mesoamerican or Mexican uh, uh, Guatemalan regions before the European discovery, the Aztecs and the Mayans uh, prepared a version of hot chocolate uh, but they didn't have sugar at all. And they added things like flowers, uh, perfumed substances. Uh, coffee was a bitter beverage, um, not served in Arabia with sugar. So that European taste was to add sugar to these things and then often to eat them with pastries uh, with uh, more sugar. So even with this, crucial significance, food history is not a topic whose importance in the Western world is immediately obvious. I teach a class at Yale in this subject and have asked students what their parents think when they tell them they are taking this course. And many responses boil down to some version of, I sent you to Yale to study stuff like this. Uh, the parents think that this is some sort of, again, frivolous uh, or just uh, easy or uh, lifestyle course. I, I think that this uh, contempt for food as a serious subject is different or not really present in the same way in China. Uh, and that so for this audience, I don't have to struggle to explain why food matters uh, as much as I do for uh, a US audience. In Western thought, it's been commonly asserted that beyond its merely biological or medical importance, food does not matter 
that it's not an intellectual subject. Um, and I have a couple of examples. The 16th century French philosopher and essayist, Michel de Montaigne, recalled an amusing conversation with a chef who regarded his job with inappropriate gravity. The cook, Montaigne reported, referred pompously to the science of eating, affecting, quote, a grave and magisterial countenance as if he were discussing grand points of theology, unquote. Montaigne found it laughable that a mere kitchen servant should describe salads and roast meat as if they merited the high seriousness of uh, the government of an empire. 400 years after Montaigne's remarks, the distinguished uh, French chef Jacques Pepin in his youth experienced a um, similar and rather more consequential dismissal of cuisine as a worthy subject of inquiry. Uh, Pepin was already a famous chef in France when he uh, immigrated to the United States at the age of 20, maybe 21. And he wanted to go to college and he did enter Columbia University in New York and received a bachelor's degree in 1970. He then went on to graduate school also at Columbia uh, in French literature. But when he proposed a doctoral dissertation topic in food and French literature, his advisor told him contemptuously that this theme was out of the question. The reason not much has been written on this topic, Monsieur Papin, the professor said, is that cuisine is not a serious art form. He assured Papin uh, that it is far too trivial for academic study not intellectual enough to form the basis of a PhD thesis. Within the European and North American cultural areas, then, cuisine has not been considered comparable to performing arts, such as opera, or academic subjects, such as philosophy. <coughs> Recipes and dining out attract popular interest and discussion, but so do many other diversions from fashion to hang gliding, uh, but these are not um, academically respectable topics. As I said, I think it's different in China, where at various times it has been deemed appropriate for learned people to write poetry or discourse on food topics, often in the context of memory and nostalgia. Uh, first person familiar essays are a traditional literary genre of self reflection often expressing longing for the past. And longing for the past is very often tied up with longing for the food of the past, be that childhood or food before some misfortune overtook you, um, recalling in poverty and pleasures, uh, in poverty um, and want, the pleasures he had enjoyed during the last years of the Ming Dynasty, the 17th century essayist Zhang Dai lovingly described uh, a crab club that he had belonged to, whose members extensively discussed river crabs during the fall season. That is, they ate the crabs um, along with salted and dried duck, junket, blood clam steeped in wine, cabbage, uh, and fruit and discoursed on the food. The food was not simply a form of fuel or even a pleasant form of fuel or an ephemeral pleasure. He says in recollection, it is really as though we had tasted the offerings of the immortals come from the celestial kitchens. And that kind of statement from an intellectual in the Western tradition is uh, rare to the point of non-existence. Much more common would be <clears throat> the attitude of the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein um, in the mid 20th century, who remarked, I don't care what I eat as long as it's the same thing every day. So um, this has a venerable tradition. I won't go into it in great detail, but another course I teach at Yale <clears throat> is a collaborative course on great books of the Western tradition. And we recently finished Plato's Republic. 
And Plato through Socrates in describing his ideal society uh, recommends that they have a diet of barley and wheat flat cakes or maybe made into bread accompanied by moderate quantities of wine and very little else. One of Socrates' uh, young interlocutors, a man named Glaucon, protests against such a harsh regime. And so Socrates cheerfully, if grudgingly, agrees to allow salt, olives, cheese, boiled roots, figs, peas, and beans. And as a special treat, uh, they can toast acorns by the fire. Uh, and, and Glaucon's response to this uh, comical diet is that <clears throat> it seems more appropriate for pigs than for human beings. Humorous it may be, but nevertheless, the point remains that for Plato, elegant dining is dangerous. At best, it is a distraction from the important work of philosophy. And at worst, the desire for luxuries is what motivates uh, wars, uh, expansion, trade, all sorts of things that Plato regards as destructive and as um, examples of what had happened to uh, Athens in its disastrous wars of the fifth century BC. Well, despite all this learned dismissal, um, uh, food really does possess meaning beyond its routine aspects. Uh, it particularly is something evocative of loss and loss can continue can mean personal tragedy or simply getting older and losing touch with the things that gave you pleasure as a young person. Uh, the COVID epidemic and its isolation, uh, an isolation that has been very harsh in many parts of the world and psychologically very difficult, has um, reminded us of the importance of food, often food taken together. Um, so people who've been alone during the isolation have for, felt particu particularly poignantly this loss. So involuntary displacement, exile, confinement, reinforce the symbolic significance of food. Uh, a particularly disturbing example of this is a cookbook that was put together by Jewish women imprisoned in the Theresienstadt concentration camp during the Nazi regime. This was a privileged concentration camp. Uh, um, I use that word sarcastically, but it was the camp that well-known international people or people who had a lot of relatives abroad were put into. Um, and it was presented as a model camp. Uh, but even so, most of the people in it were um, uh, near starving. And these women put together a cookbook from memory. Obviously, they had, had not brought cookbooks with them, and they had very little food to experiment with. The recipes were based on their recollection of the comforting everyday food of home. In the face of attempts to obliterate and dehumanize, the Theresienstadt cookbook reaffirmed the Jewish women's personal integrity. Recalling specific foods and how to prepare them constituted a form of psychological resistance and self-preservation. So in writing uh, Why Food Matters, I was interested in how food serves to define and reinforce group identity and distinction. So distinctions include um, class, what the upper class in various societies eats, what the lower classes subsist on, and often the stereotypes about what is appropriate for rich people and what rich people imagine poor people eat. I'm also very interested in gender, in um, notions of different preferences that women have um, versus those of men. So in the United States, by the late 19th century, it was thought that men liked hearty food, meat, food with a lot of spices in it, uh, and that women liked delicate food. 
food with whipped cream or mayonnaise or gelatin. Uh, on the other hand, women were also supposed to be particularly fond of dessert, <clears throat> of sweet dishes. So you know, where did this come from? Uh, how does it play out in the modern world? Uh, race also, always an important consideration in any history of the United States. But uh, rather than go through a synopsis of the book in the um, half hour or so that I have remaining, I want to look at how food brings people together and its symbolic but vitally significant community building functions. The word commensality, meaning meals taken in company, um, is often thought of as a sort of a jargon academic word, but it's actually a venerable term attested since the 17th century. The lexicographer and writer Samuel Johnson in the 18th century defined commensality as fellowship of the table, the custom of eating together. So it is a pompous word. Mensa means table in Latin. So commensality is eating at the same table. Among everyone's happiest memories uh, are celebrations uh, involving food, life expression, life affirming expressions of family, of community solidarity, uh, accompanying marriages, anniversaries, school graduations, and the like. Uh, the prophet Muhammad praised commensality. Uh, Eat together and do not separate. Blessing is in society, he said. Uh, the 11th of the 12 Shiite Imams is supposed to have remarked that when you sit at table with your brothers, sit long, for it is a time that is not counted against you as part of your lives, unquote. Commensality represents religious ceremony as well as worldly togetherness. One of the great books of 20th century anthropology uh, by Clifford Geertz was called The Religion of Java, uh, the island in Indonesia, and it was published in 1960. And he centered this long study around one particular ceremony involving food called a slamatan. A slamatan is a short ceremonial meal, carefully structured, understated, and held in response to occurrences, both favorable and unfavorable. So moving to a new house uh, requires a slamaton, uh, but the death of a loved one does as well. At the slamaton, nothing of substance is mentioned relating to what is being commemorated. So there's no toasting. There's no moment of silence. Eating together by itself creates a ritual bond. The food is traditional. It's served in banana leaves. Uh, it's eaten uh, while sitting on the floor. Uh, the men consume it and the women prepare it. Um, when I was a student in college, I lived in Java for six months uh, in 1970, and I participated in a slamaton with the family that I lived with uh, when unfortunately the wife had a miscarriage. And so the response to this miscarriage was a slamaton, and nobody said anything. It wasn't, you know, uh, like, oh, uh, you know, I'm sure you, if you try again, you'll be successful, or, uh, you know, I'm so sorry. That, characteristic of this meal and indeed of Javanese culture in general is a kind of transcendence of the trauma of everyday life. Um, in uh, Europe and the United States, there are more ostentatious celebrations of life events. So destination weddings, school graduation parties, major birthdays are often very elaborate, including the catering. What's happened, however, uh, is that ordinary family meals, by contrast, have sort of fallen apart. Uh, the members of the family have different tastes, so the teenage children may be vegetarian. Uh, they have different schedules, so uh, often uh, people eat um, meals that they put together by themselves, even standing up. 
And there's a lot of lamentation uh, among social critics and observers that the former routine of sitting down together uh, to dinner to exchange news is, um, is a thing of the past, right up there with rotary telephones or uh, typewriters. As meals have become more hurried and utilitarian, uh, there has been then this kind of panic about the decline of community. But in fact, uh, commensality is alive and well, at least in restaurants. Restaurants are immensely popular, at least they were before the pandemic and they're struggling to come back now in whatever we call this uh, period of pandemic semi-recovery. And this popularity of restaurants is not only because of uh, the foodie wave, the wave of enthusiasm for uh, everything having to do with dining. Um, it has a lot to do with uh, ways of socializing and of confirming and extending relationships. Conversation at the table tells you about the other person which is why the first instinct in wanting to get to know someone new is to share a meal with them. That doesn't mean that all examples of commensality or cordial. Um, in the United States, we uh, recently finished the Thanksgiving holiday and Thanksgiving is certainly a time of gathering together over an excessively large meal and eating foods that most people uh, don't eat at any other time of year. But in recent times, newspapers have been full of advice about how to avoid fights over Thanksgiving, um, political, uh, for example, or uh, old family tensions that are covered over when you, know, you don't see uh, this cousin who you think stole um, a, uh, uh, an item of silver from uh, <clears throat> your parents when they died. That kind of family conflict, a simmering family conflict is associated with Thanksgiving now, much to the detriment of the uh, reputation of that holiday. But uh, uh, let's return to restaurants. There are um, four kinds of restaurant commensality or socialization, I'd like to uh, very briefly discuss. The first is romance. The second is friendship. The third is celebration. And the fourth is business. If we start with romance. So there have been historically many ways of meeting potential uh, partners. Uh, arranged marriages um, to online dating sites. In classical and medieval literature uh, of the West, uh, couples did not tend to develop relationships over meals. Uh, in Dante's Hell, he meets the lovers Paolo and Francesca, who had an illicit uh, relationship that began when they were reading chivalric romances together. In Jane Austen's era in 18th century England, promising matches might be encouraged by strategic seating at meals. But the way you met uh, uh, people was by introductions at balls, dances, uh, and chaperoned visits. Romance at restaurants requires sufficient relaxation of social rules to allow a young woman to be alone with a young man. Uh, and in Northern Europe and the United States, this starts to happen in the late 19th century. Uh, a once famous American novel by a once famous American writer named William Dean Howells. The novel is called A Modern Instance and was published in 1882. There's a scene where um, a man named Bartley impresses uh, a naive woman named Marcia. Um, by taking her out to one of the fanciest restaurants of Boston at this time, uh, the dining room of the Revere House Hotel. And Marcia is dazzled by his skill at understanding the menu, the wine list, ordering with a nonchalance that um, she finds impressive. Restaurants are not places to start a relationship, but rather to follow up an initial encounter. For a long time, dinner was uh, something that a couple planned in their first early acquaintance, a recognized stage in the progress of intimacy. 
if we proceed from romance to meals among friends, um, in uh, my country, certainly these involve a wider range of dining contexts. So that, for example, in many, many American small towns, um, circles of older men meet for breakfast uh, at a McDonald's or other cafe or a donut place. Uh, and they share news, tell stories, uh, make random complaints and observations. And this kind of relationship, friendship, is the reverse of courting, uh, of uh, romance, because here the point of getting together is not finding out about someone you just met, but rather going over the stories and um, complaints of people you've known for years. So the fact that you've heard these stories before is part of the comforting routine of meals such as these. Um, this kind of camaraderie also used to be true of adolescence. Uh, the 1982 movie Diner, for example, this is a movie set in Baltimore in 1959, and it involves a bunch of guys who are about to graduate from high school. And they meet at this diner, at this informal kind of restaurant. Um, and they talk a lot about girls, about the frustrations of life, uh, and about their plans. And what it is, is a kind of they're preparing to go their separate ways. They may never meet again. Uh, and food here has a role of establishing a kind of relationship that will, uh, at least in their minds, endure the destructive effect of time. But this is not really true in the 20th uh, anymore. In the 21st century, um, millennial and Generation Z conduct much of their lives online. They're also very conscious of time. Uh, my students, uh, at least what I <clears throat> understand, you know, sort of set aside 10 minutes at Starbucks for a meeting with someone else. I mean, they're, they're sort of like booked and um, uh, their way, they have ways of wasting time, but their ways of wasting time don't usually involve uh, long meals at uh, restaurants. So uh, from friendship to festive events, obviously celebrations are a very old form of group dining. Roman banquets, Native American meals called potlatches in which there's a kind of competitive gift giving are famous examples of collective feasts. Our society uh, makes a point of observing family-oriented occasions such as anniversaries or birthdays. And finally, meals provide business, professional, and political occasions to talk face-to-face -face, uh, about sometimes vitally important affairs. Winston Churchill, for example, very carefully prepared the dinners that he gave for political allies and rivals, including meetings at Yalta and Potsdam with Stalin, Roosevelt, and Truman. Um, the uh, uh, dinners that uh, Mao Zedong gave for Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger are famous examples of food and diplomacy. <clears throat> and the reaction in the United States to these dinners was in 1972 was, was uh, extraordinary, not only um, uh, the fact that this was happening, but that Henry Kissinger and Nixon had learned to use chopsticks, had spent uh, several weeks practicing uh, or getting tutorials in how to um, uh, manipulate food with chopsticks showed a kind of um, uh, dedication or commitment that was not otherwise thought of as characteristic of these two men. So um, uh, often business lunches in the United States have been extremely important. Uh, there was a autobiography about Hollywood by Julia Phillips in 1991 about all the intrigues, deals, betrayals, backstabbing, uh, and its title is You'll Never Eat Lunch in This Town Again. That was a threat in 1991, meaning nobody's going to talk to you. Um, and uh, now uh, in Hollywood, people don't, people don't have lunch together as a way of initiating or sealing 
deals. There are some industries like publishing. So in New York, there are still some restaurants that publishers, agents, uh, and authors uh, can be found at, uh, particularly over lunch. But this is mostly a kind of antiquated survival. The people who are in things like banking or real estate <clears throat> no longer use lunch as a deal-making uh, uh, occasion. So um, commensality can be comical or tragic. Uh, uh, the sense of food and dining having a meaning or significance is what I want to emphasize, uh, as opposed to the notion that meals are just necessary for biological survival. I'm not really in trying to say that um, university curricula need to have a place for food history. Um, rather, I would encourage uh, us to think about food as significant in many experiences of life that are not immediately about food. Cooking, recipes, dining out, celebrations are not just practical ways of getting by. They're making sense of the world. Uh, culture is how we organize and regulate experiences according to unwritten but familiar codes. Beyond its physical significance then, food is one of the most important of such methods of orientation. Uh, so for example, Americans dislike organ meat, um, a revulsion that was not true 150 years ago, um, but uh, not, and not shared by most of the rest of the world. Uh, on the other hand, uh, tastes change. Not only did Americans um, abandon organ meat during the 20th century, but from 1950 to 2000, they became much more fond of spice in food. Uh, I lived in the Southern United States from 1979 until 1997 in Nashville, Tennessee. In 1979, most of the food was bland. But the arrival of Thai restaurants, as well as such fads as buffalo chicken or blackened fish dramatically changed that. So much so that there's now a dish called Nashville hot chicken, which is a, a deep fried chicken with a very crispy skin. And it's very highly spiced. And the idea that this should be associated with Nashville still seems to me to be uh, amusing. So the point is, Food defines us. We manipulate food uh, for pleasure. Uh, and while a lot of the book deals with food and its divisions and its um, inequities and its problems, uh, I recall the remark of the French diplomat and um, raconteur, uh, the Count Talleyrand, who said of dinner, show me another pleasure that comes around every day and lasts an hour. And so on that note, uh, thank you for listening to this. And if you have comments or questions, uh, I'd be delighted to hear them. Great, thank you so much, Paul. Um, so we'll move into a time of uh, question and answer. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type them out in the chat box. Uh, that would be one way to ask them. And the other thing you can do is just use the raise hand function on the bottom of your screen. Uh, and if you raise your hand, I will be happy to call on you and you can uh, interact directly with Professor Friedman. And of course, like I mentioned before, uh, if, if you are asking a question, it'd be great if you could turn your cameras on uh, just so we can have uh, a, a little bit of an in-person interaction um, if that's possible. So anybody with questions, please feel free to chat, uh, use the chat box or uh, type in um, the chat box or raise your hand. I see yeah, that so, uh, we have uh, why is meat associated with masculinity in American culture? Um, I think some of this is found in many other cultures. Uh, certainly, it was found in Britain, and its influence on America is strong. So, the British in the 18th century, for example, defined them as against themselves, against the French, 
uh, exalting beefsteak as the sort of right of every freeborn Englishman. And the beefsteak was to be eaten without the sauces and ornamentations that the effeminate French seemed to prefer. <clears throat> this is very strong in the United States now. Um, the, uh, uh, and has a political overtone. Uh, uh, people uh, in uh, supporters of President Trump, for example, and Trump himself has encouraged this belief that um, uh, the liberals are gonna take away meat just like they wanna take away guns. They're gonna take away steaks and you're gonna have to eat artificial meat. This is a polemical idea of, uh, of great strength. Another um, uh, factoid is <clears throat> there's been a trend for young women going out on those first dates that I mentioned, the romantic dinners or potentially romantic dinners, um, that they'll order steak. And that is a signal to the guy that the girl is not a vegetarian and that she's not going to bother him about his diet. Right? That if she sees him eating something that is not particularly healthful, she's not going to say, oh, you shouldn't eat that. And what the man is afraid of is being bossed around by the woman. That's one of the things he's looking for in uh, an initial relationship. And so her ordering steak is like proclaiming a safe zone. All right. If he wants to eat pork rinds or deep fried, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, or French fries, or uh, I don't know, deep fried candy bars. That's fine with her. Yeah, uh, Chang, you have your hand up. Yep. So I'm gonna ask him to unmute, Chang Fei. Oh, thank you so much for the lecture. Yeah, I actually have a question, like it's kind of personal. Cause like, uh, I remember when I was young, my mom used to tell me like how important, how significant is a Chinese Christmas, uh, the Chinese New Year Eve. Like there was such a big meal and this is such an important event to her because she told me like in the 1970s, this is the only occasion where she can access to a fresh, fresh fish uh, because people were really poor at that time. But now it's like both I and my family members become increasingly indifferent to such special occasions like uh, like Chinese uh, Chinese New Year Eve or like Mid Autumn Festival, do you think that uh, as like because of the like development of the modern agriculture and the improvement of the supply chains make most food accessible to ordinary people, even though those food that was luxuries before, do you think that this trend is going to diminish the value of food or significance of food in social relations that you mentioned in this lecture? I think it has a negative effect that you've described of diminishing celebrations. In other words, uh, either people are busy, they have more options, they're living far away. Um, and the food that at one time was special is no longer special. So you certainly get this with American Thanksgiving. Um, the whole point of Thanksgiving was originally um, like what you're describing for people who are, if not uh, really poor, at least don't have a whole lot of choice in what to eat. Uh, you had this splendid meal once a year. Well, now, you know, problems of obesity are more important or at least more visible uh, than problems of malnutrition. And so um, uh, the significance of the food in the holiday is less. It becomes even amusing. People say, you know, people are so unused to roasting meat that uh, uh, the uh, many people try to make the turkey on Thanksgiving and, and don't really know how to use their oven because they never use their oven except that day. I think in China it's different, uh, partly because uh, uh, there has been so much emphasis on food as an expression of culture because of the availability of so many different ingredients and cuisine. Uh, and um, uh, food takes different forms of prestige. So in the United States, uh, distance no longer matters. I mean, anybody can get bananas cheaply. Uh, on the other hand, to get food uh, that is seasonal or that tastes like what you remember it should, to take an example, asparagus. 
So when I was growing up, you could only get asparagus in March and April. Uh, and it, uh, I guess by the time I was a teenager, it came from California in the spring. Uh, now it's available all, all year round from Mexico and Peru, but it's not actually very good um, when you compare it to the seasonal asparagus uh, that you get in the spring if you really look hard for it. And it's much more expensive. That is the local asparagus grown say in New York or New Jersey is much more twice or three times the price of asparagus from Peru. So I think that you'll find that it's just that the definition of what foods are prized changes rather than people taking all food for granted. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think that's fair. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question from the chat box. Uh, right. Uh, thoughts on the rise the of- On-demand on food, demand food, food delivery platforms. So I think this has had a tremendous impact in cities like Beijing, has it not? Um, uh, including to the point of having a, a tremendous problem of waste disposal since food delivery comes with all sorts of packaging and stuff like that. Uh, I haven't done any research related to this topic. Um, it's so new, but the studies I've seen um, uh, certainly suggest that it's uh, an expanding category, particularly uh, in cities. And uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's changing restaurants. Many restaurants have converted into what are called ghost kitchens. So a ghost kitchen is a place that prepares food for delivery and takeout only. Um, uh, and it can even offer different cuisines. And, you know, it will have a name like, um, uh, I don't know, Bangkok Temple, but it's not a restaurant, it's a delivery service. Um, we'll see if that uh, flourishes after COVID. I, I would like to say no, but I'm probably wrong about that. So also in the chat, a plant-based diet for sustainability. Uh, this is a crucial question. And a lot of it depends on how closely uh, plant-based products can imitate meat. Uh, they seem to have done a very good job. Uh, uh, crucially, will be to go beyond ground meat. So I think already uh, Impossible Burger, Beyond uh, uh, Meat uh, and the like are actually uh, likely to have a, a substantial market share. <clears throat> it is true that it is literally unsustainable for us to continue to eat meat produced the way meat is produced now in the escalating global quantities. <clears throat> and so um, the, the question is partly, will people be willing to give up meat under what circumstances? And then also, um, you know, how long is this going to be able to go on? And it, 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 it can't. Uh, the impact of meat, uh, of livestock rearing, of um, the destruction of forests to create pastures, uh, the creation of methane gas by concentrated feeding operations, uh, the transport of uh, uh, animals and animal carcasses, all this has a, exacts a tremendous, tremendous cost. Having said that, am I a vegetarian by conviction? Uh, no, actually. I certainly try to think about what I eat. Uh, I try to use meat as more of a flavor uh, than as an everyday you know, main course. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, uh, here I have some hope for technology. There was another question in the chat box. Um... I'm curious about whether different types of cutleries reflect features of different cultures. Uh, yes. For example, why do Chinese people use chopsticks, whereas Europeans use forks and knives? Um, some of it, I think, is just culture preference and not explicable by some functional ex explanation. Nevertheless, um, uh, this has to do with meat eating and meat eating in large pieces. The one tool that Europeans always brought to a meal or were given at a meal in the Middle Ages was a knife. 
Um, so the knife is necessary uh, uh, beyond a fork, spoon, or any other implement uh, because you're served pieces of meat that have to be cut. And um, uh, forks are later. Uh, so knives and uh, uh, spoons, uh, spoons for uh, the poor people, also for things like porridges uh, and uh, gruels. Um, chopsticks are useful in um, a, a meal in which the meat is already cut up uh, and in which you tend not to be served large pieces of meat, which you then have to slice yourself. That's not a explanation that covers everything. Uh, another contrast that's interesting is eating with your hands. So in uh, Indonesia, where as I said, I ate, <clears throat> I lived rather um, for six months, um, some meals were taken with uh, the, the hand and um, only the right hand, of course. Uh, I had the misfortune uh, or comical misfortune to be left-handed. And it was very hard for me to remember to use my right hand. Uh, it's just considered horribly disgusting to use your left hand, certainly unthinkable to use it for food. And even, even like to offer money, like you're at a store and you're paying. And I would take the money out of my wallet with my left hand and then put it in my right hand and pay with my right hand. Uh, you know, I think nice try. Uh, but uh, I had a student who was from uh, Bangladesh and I asked her, I'm always interested in uh, uh, international students' responses to, uh, you know, being in college in the United States, uh, you know, what, what, what her food experiences had been. And she said the hardest thing uh, uh, was uh, getting used to eating with a fork, uh, knife and spoon. Uh, not that she had any problem, you know, like manipulating the instrument, but it, it didn't feel like she was actually eating. But somehow if you eat with your hand, you're, you're actually consuming the food. Whereas for her, eating with a fork and knife was almost like, like being intravenously fed. You know, you're not hungry, but you're also not experiencing the pleasure that you associate with dining. That's fascinating. Uh... Lynn, we have a question. Lynn, yeah. Um, hi, uh, thank you very much, Professor Fredman. Um, thank you for the lecture. I have a question also about the plant-based diet. Um, I feel like now the plant-based diet, um, sorry, can you hear me clearly? Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, say that again. Yeah, um, now I, I found that plant-based diet gets very mm. popular global wide. Um, it's especially very popular in uh, Western countries in general. Um, I stayed in London for the past four years and um, it's just the industry, the, the market for plant-based diets just grow tremendously. And I feel like uh, now after I came back to China, uh, I'm currently based in Shanghai, there's also a huge trend of vegan burger and uh, uh, vegan, vegan fried chicken, but at the, at the same time in the Chinese culture, we have plant-based diet already. For example, the tofu, which you can get the plant-based protein. So um, my question is, do you think it is still necessary for the um, say Chinese market to embrace uh, or to build factories to produce another sort of plant-based um, product and um, yes. <clears throat> I think you would know the answer better than I. In other words, I am curious as to, on the one hand, from the outside, uh, we are all aware that China has a very long tradition of plant-based uh, uh, cuisine, of uh, giving credit to vegetables as something other than a kind of mere accompaniment, uh, and of all sorts of mock preparations, that is, uh, uh, tofu, uh, used to uh, resemble duck. On the other hand, as a country that has still um, a substantial population that is becoming newly affluent, um, meat consumption has risen. 
uh, in recent years tremendously uh, because people have more money. And one of the first things people do when they have more money is change their diet. And the changes uh, for reasons of prestige as well as taste often mean um, uh, an increase in meat eating. So uh, those two trends are different. They're not incompatible, but um, uh, I wonder which is going to be more important. Uh, is vegan uh, diet popular with people in places like Shanghai uh, or you know the young people in Shanghai or tastemakers in Shanghai? Uh, what is the majority of the population uh, in other cities that may be you know, less uh, culturally advanced like uh, to say nothing of rural areas? So yes, I think there is still a need to try and um, uh, uh, shift diets, but the advantage in China is that uh, there is a long heritage of uh, cuisines that are not dependent on uh, meat for their effects. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Max had another question in the chat box. Uh, referring to power lunches and uh, meals being significant for politicians and business people. Um, but now his observation is that finance people don't really prefer meals for business settings. Uh, and you talked about this a little bit, but sort of what do you think is the reason for some of these shifts? I think they think it's a waste of time. Uh, and the, uh, <clears throat> I mean, they still play golf and stuff. Uh, so there's still plenty of uh, informal social networking that goes on uh, in these industries. But um, <clears throat> um, the deals are faster. Uh, they often involve um, uh, uh, remote conversations via Zoom or other platforms. Uh, my wife is a, a corporate lawyer and is both taking advantage of and suffering from multiple time zones. So a deal that involves people in China uh, and in uh, the UK. Um, so, uh, you know, in certain areas, you just have to be able to put things together, uh, perhaps without ever meeting in person, the interlocutors. And oh, another question from Chang Yifei. This may be the last one. Uh, hi, Professor Freeman. Yeah, sorry, I have another question. Like, it's Please. inspired by the discussion. Yeah, it's, it's inspired by the discussion about the plant-based meal that like we discussed just now, right? So it's, I think I observed something really interesting in my life. It's like in my mom's time, right? Like in 1970s, 1980s, like in China, like the to rich people, they can have meat like every day on their dish table. They like meat so much. But to the poor people, actually, the only available food to them is the healthy food we talk about today, like the sweet potatoes, the vegetables, these things, right? But now, like in 21st century, I found that the trend is actually reversed. I'm currently in South Africa, which is a very racially divided society. And I found like in the restaurants, the people who choose the plant-based meals are mainly those white people, rich white people. And they kind of like use plant-based meal to show that they're more like social economically more advanced but like to the poor black people in South Africa is that they still they still like very stick to meat and they think like that they prefer meat in their veg restaurants so what do you think caused the reverse of the trend about people's choice of meat or vegetables or plant-based meal yeah I, yes well I think the short answer is a lot has to do with body image so uh, a lot of those people in South Africa, just as everywhere um, in uh, you know, the sort of developed world, uh, a sign of prestige is thinness uh, or, or athletic uh, uh, body. And so it's very striking uh, in the United States that the problems of obesity, this is a country where um, you know, easily a third of the population uh, is seriously overweight. Um, this is associated with uh, poor people, rural people, uh, and um, people in the middle of the country. So um, 
uh, I have a friend who teaches medieval history now at Fordham University in New York. And previously he was at the University of Colorado, which is in Boulder, Colorado. A beautiful, beautiful place at the base of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and Boulder is a place that's even hipper than California. And, uh, you know, everybody's uh, vegetarian. The vegetarians are the, you know, the right wing. The vegan is, uh, everybody's in beautiful condition. Everybody looks like they just stepped out of a magazine. I mean, obviously not everybody, but that's the sort of image one has of Boulder. And my friend is maybe 10 pounds overweight. And when I said something like, how could you leave paradise uh, to come to gritty old uh, uh, New York in, in the Bronx at that uh, to teach? And he said, you know, I was tired of being the fattest man in Boulder, Colorado. So, you know, fattest man in Boulder, Colorado, 10 pounds overweight. He's not, you know, he's not morbidly obese by any stretch of the imagination. So it, a, a lot of this has to do with, um, uh, with a desirable body image. And um, some of it certainly has to do with uh, taking responsibility for uh, environmental deterioration. Uh, but it's, you know, it's similar to mindfulness, yoga, um, uh, sustainable um, uh, uh, coffee, you know, uh, uh, artisanal coffee drinking. Um, it, it, you know, it's part of what an observer called global Bro Brooklyn. And what you're experiencing is glo global Brooklyn. Uh, Brooklyn standing in for, I mean, this is a typically arrogant American assumption that uh, its tastes rule the world. But you know what I mean. One, one could also, um, uh, I'm sure, identify certain neighborhoods in Chinese cities uh, that are full of these same kinds of, uh, uh, um, uh, of things. You could even have it global New Haven, as long as New Haven was defined as just the area right around Yale, since in fact, New Haven is a a city of uh, a tremendous poverty otherwise. Uh, but yeah, that's a fascinating observation. Thank you. Yeah, certainly changing tastes and globalization um, will play a, a large role um, in sustainability as well. So I think that's a good way to sort of tie everything we've discussed uh, together. Um, and uh, going back to one of Paul's earlier books uh, about, about taste and how that had sort of if you can sort of affect people's taste and what they perceive as prestigious um, and that will change food ways and, and, and ultimately change. And may I just say that that book on taste called Food, the History of Taste uh, uh, exists in a Chinese ed edition published by the right. University of Zhejiang. That's right, that's right. It's the um, sole, sole work of mine that's been translated into Chinese. Actually, Not that just, that means anything to this audience since you're in your <laughs> Uh, I actually just saw it recently at, at, a, uh, at a restaurant. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Friedman, for joining us for this mm -hmm. fascinating talk. Thank you, everybody, for uh, taking time to uh, have this discussion. Uh, I hope that uh, it was uh, inspirational to many of you to go and have a meal with somebody uh, if, if, it's, if COVID permissions uh, per per permits you to do so. Um, but uh, yeah, here's to having many more great meals together. Um, and uh, we do this every, every talk, but uh, I'm gonna ask people if we're willing to take a group photo. Uh, this is some semblance of, of having a time together. Uh, if you are willing to turn on your camera so we can have a group photo, um, then that would be great. So uh, say cheese, I guess, one, two, three cheese. Thank you so much, uh, and I will unmute everybody. Thank so you, everybody. Everyone. Thank. Um, it's a pleasure. Paul. Well, bye, bye, Devin. We'll talk. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank, Thank you. you. Everybody. Yeah, Thank you too. You. Thank Have you. Have a pleasant Thank evening. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.